Welcome to another episode of Judgment Date. As you know, these are a series of programs that we've been putting up because we think that perhaps people want to debate issues of the lockdown, the consequences of the lockdown, implications of the lockdown, and in fact, the future beyond the lockdown. And they're troubling times, and one hopes that perhaps some of these programs give people uh, at least an ability to think through some of these questions which are troubling the entire nation and indeed the world. And tonight I've got Ronald uh, Kupaldis, uh, who I think is from Single Asset Management, and, and a fellow at Gibbs, and Professor Adrian Savoy from um, Gibbs. Thank you very much to both of you. And the reason I asked both of you to come on, because you wrote a very interesting article, the two of you, for the Daily Maverick, which raised a whole lot of profound questions. And I wondered whether we perhaps start off by just sort of lifting our gaze and looking at the global rather than the, uh, than the local, we'll come back to the local. And I wanted to ask, and you, either of you can take it if you want, perhaps I'll start with you, Ronak, is, is, is what do you, I mean, what do you make of the implications for the, both the global economy and global governance post COVID-19? How, how do you think this is gonna change our world, our global world, both economically and governance wise? as we move, as the world moves out of COVID-19 finally. Um, thanks for, for having us, Dennis. Uh, it's a pleasure yeah, yeah. to be here. Um, so I think COVID-19 has really held up a mirror in a lot of ways and exposed a lot of the deficiencies in, in a number of countries across the world, whether it's political, whether it's economic, or whether it's in terms of healthcare systems. Um, and, you know, when myself and Adrian were, were looking at the at the, the narrative and the economic responses to this new no normal or this, this, this concept of this unprecedented crisis, we were quite underwhelmed because there was this kind of approach where we wanted to go back to the old way of doing things as opposed to reimagine the world in a different way. And this very much seems like a seminal moment to, to us. Um, you know, it, it has the kind of contours of a 1989 kind of era where suddenly the world changed quite dramatically over the course of a number of months. You remember in 89, you had Tiananmen Square, you had the fall of the Berlin Wall, you had the execution of the leader of Romania, and then you had the release of Mandela. And this kind of has uh, very, very similar features in, in my mind. So the two things that are, that are coming to light is that globalization as we know it is going to change, whether it's going to be in retreat, or whether it is going to reform dramatically, I think is, is still up for debate. Uh, capitalism, as we know it, traditional two-dimensional capitalism uh, is going to need to change. And then you've got two other themes emerging, which is digitization. As we know, many of us in the services economy have transitioned quite, quite seamlessly to working online, to being zombies, if you will. Um, and then you've also got localization with border closures, with restrictions on travel, with restrictions on movement of people, goods, and services, uh, we've had to adapt. And I think that could spur um, an era of localization, which for me is quite exciting in an African context, uh, given the, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. So just, I mean, you've put up a, a lot there. So let me just ask you, I mean, you're right that perhaps this is that sort of inflection point, but where, where from your position, I mean, if we accept that capitalism is not going to be quite the same as it was, I mean, that therefore implies that the kind of capitalism we've had, the kind of thinking we've had, has to change and fairly radically. Mm -hmm. and how do you think, I mean, now, traditionally, what I mean by traditionally, over the last few, uh, few months, the sort of kind of line that's been taken, and I think that Harari, in an interview that he gave uh, relatively recently, was suggesting we could go one of two ways. We could become more cosmopolitan, and in a sense, see this world as one that cannot be governed by, you know, myopic nation states or nationalism can encroach in. And essentially, you get a kind of Donald Trump uh, writ large throughout the world because people have sort of draw inward. Where do you think this goes? I mean, from your perspective. Well, I think we need to reimagine the paradigm completely. Um, so, you know, we tend to focus on this very either or very binary way of thinking about things. So either we're going to pivot to the left and be extremely socialist, or we're going to double down on traditional neoliberal ideas. And I think what we need to do is reject those prisms and actually look at, at a both and rather than an either or 
kind of scenario. So inclusive growth is the business case because quite frankly, inequality is not sustainable. And I think, you know, the sooner we get business, the public sector, labor, thinking in the South African context to understand that, that, that you, you need to kind of work together and you need to, to come, come up with outcomes that create shared prosperity, the better it's going to be. So we need kind of more creative solutions, more collaborative solutions. Um, and I think uh, it's, you know, as I've mentioned, it's an opportunity and an inflection point really to, to understand that, that uh, prosperity, that economic models need to be reshaped in a different way. So instead of imagining this V-shaped recovery, we need to look at the roles of fiscal policy um, and monetary policy and whether they're fit for purpose. Um, and I think we, we, whatever, whichever way we land, we need to move to a, a far more inclusive setup uh, because if you look at what's happening around the world, Black Lives Matter, the climate emergency, the intersectionality of a whole bunch of other issues, um, I think it's quite clear that they all have very similar root causes um, and that the status quo is unsustainable. Adrian, I, 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 I didn't want to before. comment on that, but I'd like to ask you something flowing from that. But let me give you an opportunity to comment, if you yeah. wish, on anything we just sure. said. Sure. So uh, b before we run on to the next thing, you know, perhaps if I could just talk around some of the comments that uh, Ronak has made and the uh, issues you've raised. The first is, you know, where do we think we're pointed? Um, uh, I mean, that's, that's, that is the uh, uh, million dollar, $64 million question, is uh, where we're going to land up. Um, I know where policymakers have got us pointed, and generally policymakers have got us pointed to let's get back to where we were as quickly as possible. You know, and that's all the talk of the V-shaped recovery and uh, the fiscal pump and uh, the monetary uh, fire uh, um, uh, flamethrower. Get us back to where we were January 2020 as quickly as possible. Um, and I think that that would be a tragedy because where we were was not in a good place. Um, and it takes on various forms of tension and anxiety. And Ronak makes the point that it's not sustainable. I would venture that it actually is sustainable as long as you can hold the system together, but the tensions become increasingly uh, tight uh, and increasingly explosive. And we see this in various uh, 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 forms. So, uh, you know, it, where are we going to? We hope it is, a, a, we, what we're writing is, our hope, our ambition, is that it is a very different place from which we've come. But can I just ask you, just, uh, I just pray to this, I, I accept everything you say, but it seems to me an act of extraordinary, I don't know if it's naivety or just basically pulling the wool over the public's eyes to believe that we could get back to where we were. Because how is that going to happen? I mean, all these countries yeah. have got massive deficits. Um, this, this coronavirus isn't going to go away unless you have a vaccine in a short period of time. So, mm -hmm. so I'm curious as to, you know, if you listen to Donald Trump, for example, one has to know he cannot be talking any reality at all. <laughs> this is purely in order to win an election. And if he well, can well, build us the electorate to do that, so be it. But it ain't going to bring them back to where they were at the beginning of 220. Yeah, you know, and what I mean by bringing them back to where they were is, uh, you know, a sense of this isn't this isn't ideal, but it's 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 good enough, and you know, there was enough, you know, sort of holding the thing together. Um, and uh, you know, I, I would agree with you also in your assessment is that you know this can probably go one of at least one of two ways. And it either goes into a world of Trumpism, building walls, uh, barriers, looking inward, nationalism. Uh, if you don't have a COVID certificate, you can't come in, uh, and so on. Or uh, it goes into a world that is, uh, let's figure out the things that are wrong, and let's square up to those challenges. And there, there is a risk, you know, that that is an extremely naive view. However, uh, the, the, the world that we moved in from, you know, Ronak's making reference to the 1980s. I think the 1980s is one of those pivot points. Uh, the 1930s is another. And so we've done this before, uh, not into a We found ourselves. Perhaps we can do it again.
Let me ask. Sorry, carry on, carry on. I, I was going to say not perhaps. No, can this be a call? Uh, and 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 one of our reference points in writing this is uh, Arundhati Roy's. Uh, the pandemic is a portal. Uh, here is a window. So let me just ask one. I mean, the 1930s, which you reference, is a frightening thought, but it's a real one, mm. which is the idea that that if you get a spiral into greater degrees of chaos then ultimately either populism or some form of really kind of virus-laden nationalism with kind of being Adolf Hitler, that, that's where you go. And so the question is how, I mean, where do you think we will go to? Let me, let me put it this way. I mean, if, if you put your crystal ball, what do you think is going to actually happen? Well, I, I suspect, for, oh, first, we've got all of the ingredients of the 1930s, hey? We've got... Yeah, that's uh, very extremely stretched inequality. Uh, we've got economies in crisis. We've got uh, over indebtedness. In the 1930s, it was households. Now it's more governments. Uh, you've got industries uh, under siege. Uh, you've got um, uh, interest rates at zero. You know, all of these sort of headline attributes of the 1930s are with us now. And that, you know, that doesn't mean that therefore this will turn into a late 1930s. But we've got the we've got the cocktail ingredients. Um, maybe to be a bit of a killjoy, I suspect, uh, or to be a, a, a true economist, I suspect we'll get both. <laughs> I think that we will get some <laughs> some countries, some societies that will step through the, the that will step through the portal, through the open window, and there are others that will close it. Okay, so let me, let me then swing back to South Africa. Ronna, can I just ask you a question that you raised? Because you, mm. you raised Black Lives Matter. And mm. I'll tell you why I'm interested in that. Is because one watches this, um, you know, with increasing horror because it was the original sin in the United States of America that black people essentially were treated as slaves and never were really given to accord the dignity uh, that they, they, they deserve. Now, we don't have to be rocket scientists to sort of realize that that's very close to home. And I'm just curious the extent to which the anger will spill into South Africa of that particular kind and following from Adrian's point that if we don't do something which tangibly redresses our past, that we get into the, not just to Black Lives Matter, which is fine to have that protest and, and have that frustration, but in South Africa, given our general tendency when this is, uh, happens, that actually we reach an explosion which can, as it were, um, create real havoc for the country or turn us into a much more populist society than we'd want to be. And I just, because you raise it, I'm just interested in your view on that. Yeah, so I think there, there are a few dimensions to this. So number one, you know, there's a lot of criticism around the transition around 94 and the fact that in the eyes of many people, it was a compromise agreement and forgiveness was given before the crime was repented for. Um, and a lot was swept under the rug. And as a result, uh, there's a feeling that things weren't really properly dealt with. Now, inequality in South Africa, as we know, we're the most unequal country in the world, and that's largely along racial lines. Um, so that's another issue. Then we've effectively lost a decade through poor economic management where there hasn't been a material improvement in, in the lives of most people. Um, and, and then you add things like social media um, and the fact that, that you've effectively got um, this groundswell where people are able to express their views in real time, uh, plus the, the negative economic kind of consequences. And you've got, you've got this mass resentment, which is building up, has been building up over time uh, and is now manifesting through through this, and I think the combination of those factors mean that, of course, you know, it's 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 a universal theme, but has particular resonance in South Africa. So I don't think we can escape it. I think ultimately it deals with issues of identity and inequality, which are which are fundamental. But moving to the redress kind of part, I mean, you know, Adrian raised the point around. We'll, we'll potentially get both outcomes. And I think a lot of that is going to depend on the type of leadership that we get. You know, following the 2008 financial crisis, what we had is that people saw 
fiscal austerity being being pushed forward as a policy and they saw asset price inflation because there was cheap money going around and what that meant was that expectations were not met people thought that their lives were going to get better but the economic climate was such that it didn't that gave rise to populist elements in society and created vacuums where you, you've seen the likes of donald trump uh, bolsonaro uh, all of these kind of leaders emerging and exploiting that vacuum. now you know if you look at the countries that have done best in terms of the management of the crisis countries like new zealand uh, countries with, with female heads and compassionate yeah. female countries. women women have done brilliantly there exactly so you know there's, there's a surprise but it's true there's there's a type of, of of leadership a new type of leadership that's needed needed and potentially is the antidote to to this kind of populism so what we could see is many societies saying we've tried this populist experiment with outsiders hacking the system coming in uh we're in the midst of a crisis it's no coincidence that the countries with the highest death tolls are the ones with the most recklessly populist leaders um, and as a result, you could get a shift towards more technocratic, more compassionate, more kind and more inclusive leadership. So that's the great hope. Again, it might be naive, but I think the pendulum can swing um, in different ways. And similarly in South Africa, you know, when, when you look at the way that the crisis has been managed in South Africa, and, and my view is that the crisis has kind of three dimensions that need management. There's a political dimension, the healthcare dimension, and the economic dimension, a, a triathlon of governance, if you will. Um, so, you know, when Cyril Ramaphosa initially came out, he provided an empathetic, calming, assured figure uh, and kind of got the buy-in of society. And that was one element. Then we responded according to World Health Organization guidelines and best practice with an evidence-based, science-based approach. Um, but the economic response was, was a bit delayed and a bit lacking. And then there were a number of contradictions. And I think to effectively emerge out of this crisis in healthy shape, you need to do all three of these simultaneously rather than simply doing one well in isolation. And that requires skill, coordination, stamina. Um, and I don't think um, many countries understand that that coordination is fundamental to how you emerge on the other side, because ultimately there are going to be consequences as a result of this. Uh, our economy was not doing well prior to the crisis. Um, this has been a kind of a, a kick in the teeth. And we're going to have to pick up the pieces um, down the line. And I think that's probably something Adrian's got, got some, some quite strong views. Yes, and I wanted to ask Adrian about that. Because Adrian, I mean, I, I, I myself wrote a piece recently for the Financial Mail, which they edited. I didn't actually use the word that the government was clueless in relation to economic policy. But I did say that it was a depressing reflection that, picking up from Mark's point, that if you looked at the budget, I know it's actually relevant now, but the best we could hope for with 0.9, 1.3, and 1.6% growth over the next three years. Now, that's pathetic. So the question I suppose I have for you is, how the hell do we actually respond to the kinds of points that Ronak has been making from an economic point of view? How do we actually get this economy to work in such a way that we can address inequality and actually start having a congruence between our constitutional aspirations and our economic reality? Well, you know, a lot of uh, conversations about uh, now we're in crisis. I think this country has been in crisis for a yes. long time. Yes. Um, and we just didn't call it that. Uh, however, uh, you know, there's lovely work done by Jared Diamond uh, on upheaval, uh, where he talks about some of the markers of crisis. And one of the first markers of crisis is to acknowledge that you're in it. And for a long time, uh, this country has been denying that we are in crisis. But if I gave you a sheet of paper with these descriptors and I said, a Gini coefficient of 0.65, an unemployment rate of 30%, a youth unemployment rate of 55%, uh, very poor results in uh, Tim's and Pisa school, uh, school outcomes, or education outcomes, um, uh, a GDP per capita that has been stalled for more than a decade, and an investment rate that's barely beyond uh, replacement ratios, uh, rising uh, debt, to, debt to GDP ratios, standard enterprises that don't, uh, and the list goes on. <laughs> You've got to say, this place is in deep trouble. Mm. <laughs> and, and, and that's how we went in. <laughs> uh, you know, now, uh, you know, now that we, we went into crisis in crisis, um, you know, can we agree 
that we are in crisis. And if we, if we can agree that we are in crisis, we can now start, start talking about uh, substantial remedy. And I actually take courage from that because quite simply more of the same is going to give us more of the same. Uh, and uh, if we can agree that we are in crisis, we can then talk about uh, you know, fundamental remedies. And perhaps Tito Mboweni's 77 pager that he tabled at the end of last year is a point of departure. Um, but it, 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 it has to fundamentally question the way in which we think the solutions that have, we've been bringing that haven't worked, they can't be brought again. We have to rethink the whole thing. And uh, it's not about more money, more of the same policies. Uh, it, and I also think it, it, it requires a strong act of leadership. So for years, we've basically been told, you know, this is the time and we're in trouble and we've got to do that. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about the politicians that have been doing that. Yeah. And I mean, you know, and frankly, as they say, you know, sort of uh, talk is cheap, money buys the whiskey. And the, and, and the point about where is the whiskey? I mean, what, yeah. so if you were the minister, if you were the president of the country or the minister of finance, what two or three things would you be doing over the next month or two? to which somebody like myself would then have an aha moment and say, aha, now I see that we're starting to develop a new paradigm. What would give you the indication? Adrian Savile, who knows about these things, where you would say, okay, I can see that actually they have grasped the net or finally, rather than the usual talk, which goes nowhere. Hmm. So there's, you know, I think there's a couple of attributes. The first is, I've already made reference to this, is, it's a, is, a, is acknowledging that we are in crisis. Right. You know, so exactly. calling a state of emergency, uh, sorry, um, uh, you know, sorry. You mean the state of disaster or a state of state emergency? Of disaster, sorry, thank you. You know, calling the country a state of disaster, um, my frustration is that it sort of points outwards uh, and doesn't really go to the heart of the, you know, uh, the problems. This has been inflicted on us. Um, we're going to fix it. Uh, what, what I want, what, I, what, what, what my appeal is, is that we acknowledge, here, here are the markers. This is the, this is the extent of the trouble that we are in. We've been overtaken, you're talking about GDP, so let's use GDP per capita, uh, which is just, you know, one refinement, um, and that we have been steadily overtaken by our Latin American and East Asian counterparts. Uh, that over the last 10 years, they've steadily moved past us while we have done nothing. Um, uh, we can talk about all of the other markers, and it would be an acknowledgement that we are in crisis. Now that we can agree that we are in crisis, and we can agree on the form that that crisis takes, we can start talking about ways in which we might remedy it. And it's tempting to talk about fixing everything, but we can learn from the experiences of places like Rwanda, who are born in 1994 into the most extraordinarily socially, politically, economically horrifying circumstances. You know, what, do you, what does your list of things to do look like? It's not 100 things. It's, there are three things that we're going to work on. And here are the three things. Mm -hmm. So I want us to agree that we are in crisis. I want us to... Uh, talk about uh, what we're going to do to square up to that crisis. Choose three things or five things, not 30. And then can we speak about our progress in clearly measured and defined ways? So if we, you know, and talking about five-year solutions and 10-year solutions, to me, doesn't really cut it. I want to know 90-day solutions. Um, Ellen Johnson Sully from Liberia is another great uh, sort of demonstrator of how you square up to crisis. You well, acknowledge what, it, you measure it, you report it. Well, that's what Roosevelt did in his great attempts to get them out of the depression. Didn't do everything at once. And he said, yeah. this is what I'm going to do. And he did yeah. it. Agreed. Yeah. So, Ronak, let me ask you, if you, taking where Adrian is, which are absolutely intriguing, what would be the three things that you would do? I don't hold you to them, but I'm just interested. 
Um, so I think, so I, think, I think listeners here would say, right on, but like, okay, so now where, where does the money, is, where does the rubber hit the road? Do you want some, the, can, can we give some practical that, examples? Yes, please. No. <laughs> and you can I'll, add I'll to I'll the money. I'll buy, I'll buy Ronak some time. Um, <laughs> but you know, it, it, if you think about some, some, some really low-hanging fruit in South Africa, right. the first is a, a crisis of confidence. Ronak and I have spoken about this quite a lot. So one of the crises is the crisis of confidence. Uh, and if you can uh, appease that crisis, and if you can bring confidence back into the system, uh, you've got companies that are sitting with balance sheets, that are laden with cash. Look at the way in South African corporates have allocated cash over the last five, 10 years. It's been externally. It's not that we don't have investable funds. It's that we don't have investable funds earmarked for South Africa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in the same breath then, you know, foreign investment, uh, if it comes in bricks and mortar uh, 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 format, is a very valuable uh, ally. Uh, because it translates quickly into spillovers, linkages, multipliers, know how, know why. So I think that that is one that doesn't cost a lot of money. Uh, in fact, it just requires, here's the paper, uh, we commit to these agreements, now bring uh, your capital. I think the second is there are some industrial structures that are quite readily unlocked. And one would be uh, the telecom sector, uh, where you could unlock um, uh, Spectrum, for instance. And then the third is we have a lot of installed infrastructure that is being uh, walked past. During COVID-19, one of the suggestions was, well, why, why aren't we beaming uh, edu uh, classes uh, into, into homes? Now, not every home can, uh, you know, has the capacity to uh, uh, receive that technology, but we've got, the, uh, we've got the classes, we've got the digital classrooms. Uh, why is the, this not available? For everyone, um, and you know, so those are, you know, to me, those are some some no, easy no, wins. No, no, I agree. Um, Ronak, you want to add to that in any way? Yeah, so I mean, I agree with Adrian in the in the sense that we do have a crisis of confidence because we we lack ideological coherence in our economic policy, and we've been scoring a number of own goals. So messaging becomes really important, and and singing from the same hymn sheet, I think, is is particularly important in that con context. So stop scoring on goals is number one. Number two is for a long time under the Zuma administration, we didn't really have a, an Africa strategy, um, both on a government level, but also from a private sector level. So exercising leadership on a pan-African level, I think is really important. And as we know, Cyril Ramaphosa is chair of the African Union at the moment. Uh, and he's, he's actually made some great strides in terms of coordinating the response uh, on a pan-African level, and I'd like to see more of that, and that permeate to the private sector, because as Adrian mentions, um, these these companies do have strong balance sheets and and do have cash to spend. I think the the third element is upgrading the digital infrastructure, because the world is changing quite dramatically, and we need to be prepared, and our economy needs to be prepared and fit for purpose to to compete globally in that sense. Can I ask you on that? If I could just can I just ask you on that? I mean, I'm going to forget. Um, I mean, why have we been faffing around about spectrum? Um, I mean, you know, that's uh, what the politics around that are. I mean, that's the that's the the, the million dollar question, I guess. I mean, um, you know, ultimately, it comes down to political will. And the, but if there was the, political will, did we get it done quickly? If there I was political so. will, yeah, okay. Yeah, if there was political will, uh, yeah. you know, another aspect of low-hanging fruit would be uh, the IPPs. Um, yes, of course, of course. You know, I, I think we have established a world-class framework uh, for independent power production. World-class framework. Why, you know, why aren't we getting on with it? Uh, most of our energy is coal-fired. We've got a highly uh, energy-intensive economy. Yet we have one of the highest uh, photovoltaic radiation catchment areas in the world, um, and we, we we seem to you know, refuse ourselves the, the the opportunity to to use this. Yeah, I was told that if we could get this right, we could actually create two hundred fifty thousand new jobs. I mean, it's unbelievable that we. I mean, it's criminal that we're not doing that. I agree with you. 
Agreed. Well, you know, on that point, Dennis, you know, your reference to criminal is, uh, you know, I think that behind the obvious, there's, there's the even more obvious. And it is, if you want to encourage capital in, if you want to establish confidence in the state, uh, we need some, uh, some people put behind bars also. Ah, good question. Because when I gave a presentation myself not long, long ago, uh, this is before COVID, uh, an unbelievably influential American investor came up to me and said, I like what you had to say, but I have to tell you, when I see a couple of people with um, mm. uh, overalls, basically, then, high profile, then, then frankly, I'll come to South Africa and I'll invest. Now, frankly, right. this, is, this is a key issue. And it ra raises the question of, in of, uh, of institutions that were degraded. Yeah. yeah I mean, if I can come in there. Monica, please. Yeah, so the, 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 the criticism when we speak to investors often that we get is that South Africa is a country with a lot of transparency, but very little accountability. And of course, that, <laughs> that, needs, that needs to change quite dramatically. I mean, I think it's also important to, to put in perspective relative to other emerging markets like India, like Turkey, like, um, like Brazil, our institutional strength, at least our chapter nine institutions do work well, and it is a relative relative advantage and a comparative advantage. You've got transparency, the central bank remains independent, um, and you, you, know, you, you, you do have that level uh, of a differentiating factor relative to- And basically an impressive judiciary. Exactly, but you know, I think we, that, that alone, it's not good enough to be the least bad apple in the bunch. We need to actually excel. Um, and that requires a mindset shift in, in terms of, you know, again, making our economy fit for purpose um, in, in a new world order where we're actually so far behind in math literacy and science that we, we don't necessarily have the, the skills. Um, and I think a big part of that linked to that is around, and this is maybe a bit more of an intangible solution, but the social contract needs fixing um, because we're at each other's throats uh, quite often. And I think, you know, that building consensus in this kind of environment uh, is going to become quite important. And this is where leadership, again, becomes important, not just in terms of the public sector, but in terms of the private sector as well. And I think, you know, what, as a silver lining, what I've taken out of this crisis is that if you look at the response from business and the way that they've supported some of the initial government, government efforts through SPIRE, through the COBRA initiatives, uh, through the pledges of money and through repurposing some of their business ventures, um, it shows that, you know, this acrimony that we've had, this, this long-standing acrimony, uh, doesn't need to exist. You can, you can uh, find consensus, and hopefully through this crisis, we will be able to adopt a far more constructive economic model, because the nature, the extent, and the magnitude of our challenges is so significant that one party alone will not be able to fix them. We need collaborative efforts uh, across the board amongst all the key stakeholders and, and players in the economy. So that, you know, is, is my great hope. Well, I'm sorry, I've run out of time. I'd love to have another 40 minutes with you guys. Perhaps we, <laughs> since this lockdown looks of, of some sort, it's going to run for a long time and get you back. Because this has been a very interesting and stimulating conversation. And I like the fact that we can end on a relatively positive note. And may I say, Adrian, to you, um, I do hope that we embrace the notion of a crisis. And... Uh, get those three or four things on the table, because quite frankly, if we don't do that, as you rightly say, um, then disaster is really facing us. So thank you very much. And thank you very much for promoting thank the you, kind of public discourse that is absolutely crucial if we're gonna get out of this crisis. Thank you to both of you.